today's episode is all about the intersection between sustainability, opportunity, and the value of board games in fostering connection in fostering connection and education. This podcast is a shared space for open dialogues and a place where wisdom can be shared and where thinking expanded. Today's inspiration comes from a quote by Howard Zinn, an American historian and playwright and social actor, activist who once said, we don't have to engage in grand heroic actions to participate in change. Small acts when multiplied by millions of people can transform, can transform the world. Zinn believed that change doesn't always need grand gestures, but is within the reach of each and every one of us in our communities, our homes, and our everyday interactions. The key is simply being a good citizen. Our conversations and connections are crucial in every journey. They open doors, open us to new perspectives, and spark curiosity. I experienced this truth firsthand just recently when I saw an advertisement on the Facebook page for Melbourne Meeples a not-for-profit incorporated association dedicated to providing opportunities to its members and to the general community to play and experience a range of board games. Maybe you've never heard of them, and neither had I. But over the past two years, I created a board game, Conversations Count, and was curious to explore what a board game market would involve. I'm always curious and believe that magic and synergies often occur, and I'm well aware there's always something to learn from every experience. I had no idea what to expect, and I parked my car and walked along a couple of blocks looking for the right door and was so surprised when I walked into the Collingwood Town Hall and saw a room full of people who also had wisdom and creative skills to share through the creation of their board games. At this event, I had the pleasure of meeting Jake Bamford, his tertiary education in games design and teaching, along with his positive and outgoing personality to motivate the young and the old to never stop asking questions, to challenge the world and collaborate to improve the lives of all for connection and learning. Let's start the conversation. Sounds good. Where did this all start, Jake? Where did this all start, Jake? Yeah, so um, I grew up in a family of biologists. So both my parents uh, worked in so zoology, ecology. Uh, we had animals all around the house every day, all day. <laughs> um, I had about three or four different dogs grow- growing up. Uh, we had turtles, snakes, fish. Uh, I had some crabs. Um, I already said the snakes. There were all sorts of lizards. It was a lot of fun, but as part of that, um, I learned the importance of the natural world at a very young age, um, the posi- like where animals are in the world, where we sit in that. Um, so moving on to sort of sustainability was quite a quite a small step for me, really. Um, I'll have to admit, I didn't really enjoy school when I was younger. Um, I was a pretty terrible student, <laughs> but um, when I when, once I sort of moved on from school, I realised. That was because I didn't like the way it was, and I wanted to try and improve that. Um, so despite not liking school, I ended up doing a Master's of Teaching. <laughs> um, so I could go back and see what I could do to help fix what what ne- didn't work for me. Um, and I guess that kind of leads me to, you know, I wasn't the, I was the cre- little creative kid in the corner that wanted to do his own thing. Um, and we get even more of those now because we're actually, you know, opening up those conversations because while the content may have been relevant for the time, the engagement methods weren't what worked for me. Um, mm. And I guess that's what led me to combine my other big passion in life, which is games design. Um, I always like to say, um, you know, what led me to being a game designer uh, when when all the other kids at school, you know, you have, you know five-year-old, or two-year-old, all that sort of stuff, they're probably not two-year-old, but... <laughs> They were all being like, I want to be a fireman, policeman, all those sort of, you know, what the, what the toys they were playing with. I knew I wanted to be a game designer. I was in the corner drawing little mazes and things. Um, so I knew that was that was going to be one of my callings. Um, but as as we all know, we discover more passions as we grow up. Um, and now I've discovered that I wanted to combine my game design passion with education and then 
the great thing about that is it's all about engagement because games and play is a wonderful way to learn. And it's the way humans have actually been learning for a very, very long time. And it's only really been the last few hundred thousand, hundred or thousand years where people put a textbook in front of us and expect us to learn about the world. Um, that works for some kids, don't get me wrong, but mm. the majority learn through experience and learn through doing and learn through trying. And if you pick up something spiky and it hurts, then you know not to pick up something spiky. If you never get to have that experience, um, as long as it wasn't something horribly toxic. Um, yeah. um, but I mean, that's where, as you mentioned before, we want to be the facilitators as teachers. Um, a term that I was taught in my master's was the guide on the side. Um, which I think is a really important thing because that's we have the knowledge and experience to be on the side, not to push them through all this sort of stuff. We want to help make opportunities available to them so they can learn on their own. Absolutely. It reminds me really when I was teaching, we ran a program uh, that I was involved with, which was called Gifted and Talented. And we used to bring people into the classroom to talk about their life adventures, which might have been, you know, tricking the North Pole or, uh, you know, fashion design in the 1930s or things like that. And that sort of real life um, storytelling uh, was another really interesting way to engage. And funnily enough, that sort of do it the business community I run we always have speakers come in and uh, provide insights which is the sustainability uh, session in June is a uh, senior sustainability manager from Ernst & Young is going to talk about what small business goes do so we never stop learning it whether we're a child yep. or an adult there's always more out there so how did you get involved? You just stepping back, really. So, what, <laughs> Jump so, to so no, <laughs> it's I, I'm fascinated. That's and that's why I love conversations because there's so much mm. you can um, learn along the way. So, how did you? What was the first game you created? Oh, um, so I mean, I've created a lot of things over the time. Um, I probably started out with video games. Um, I did a lot of uh, yeah, computer game design. Um, and those games were definitely me just trying things out. Um, I picked up some very easy software that was like block-based programming. Um, I don't know if you've heard of, um, and the name's just Scratch. Scratch. It's a it's a very basic kind of programming software that you use these little blocks, and each block has a long string of programming in it. Um, but the user, like the user of the software, can just drag blocks. So it's it's super easy. Uh, anyway, uh, I was using that to design my first games. Um, and through that, I learned a lot of the basic processes um, and also what people enjoyed. Like I'd make these games for friends and then send them to them. And, you know, if they hadn't played it in a month or two, it probably meant that it wasn't really any fun. <laughs> um, yeah. It but, is um, interesting to get someone to play your game. You know, I know yes. that uh, if my conversations count game, we use it um, with adults at networking events and it does create connection. But if I've said to a family, you know, down on a beach holiday, do you want to play my game? And sometimes this look of horror comes across their face um, mm. and, they're, and they're not inclined. But we did play it with um, some sort of 16 and 18-year-olds recently, which was interesting because sometimes that age group don't necessarily want to talk too much to a room of adults. And we had a fantastic night and on their way home they were telling their mother, my niece, uh, how much fun they'd actually had. So sometimes we push ourselves into a, a zone that we don't always find comfortable and we can enjoy it as well. So I guess mm. that's part of the learning. So tell me a couple of stories about your um, environmental take uh, on education and how you're trying to make an impact in that area with your games. Yeah, for sure. So um, uh, I guess that links quite quite well with my first game because the first game I made was a game about frogs. Um, and I love frogs um, for a lot of reasons. I think they're cute. <laughs> Yes. Funny, squishy little things. Um, but also they're wonderful bioindicators. Um, so uh, are you familiar with the term bioindicator? Yes. Yeah, I, th I assume you would, being in sustainability. Um, <laughs> so I guess for, for those playing at home, um, a bioindicator is, well, kind of like if you have a little red flashing light on your, on your I don't know, your car or something, uh, it's something you should probably pay attention to. And if you're looking at your wetlands and there are no frogs, it probably means that your wetland is actually not a ver not of a very good quality. Um, so I, I guess I made Frog for, yeah, those two reasons, because I like frogs, but also because I thought frogs are something that people need to pay more attention to. 
Um, and I mean, I'll admit the concepts behind Frog were quite like the the sustainability concepts behind the actual gameplay was quite minimal. The game was just meant to be a fun way to get people to, in the room. Um, but where it was where I was really trying to make a little bit of impact in sustainability with that was the fact that it was all made with recycled materials and is done locally. Um, so I went to a little print shop in Malaga, which is a suburb back in Perth where I'm from. Well, in Perth, because that's where I am now. Um, uh, and they printed the entire game, so all 500 copies, um, using recycled materials, vegetable-based inks, uh, and all this sort of stuff that, you know, it's a drop in the ocean in the grand scheme of things. But if we all don't make a start, then it will never happen. Um, that's right. So, That's yeah. right. We can all do our little bit. And I uh, saw that game at uh, Meeple's and I, I uh, basically you have to get across the lily pads to the end and you move the pieces and it looked a little bit too like chess or checkers for my for my um, thinking. But um, mm. I was drawn to someone I had. It, it drew me back to thinking about uh, a teacher I worked with and her child had done a master's in science and it was about frogs and that's when mm. I learnt about their um, uh, benefit for understanding uh, pollution in wetland areas and things yeah. like that. So I so I related with that very quickly and then um, I actually purchased your game, Bin Off. Um, ah, because, <laughs> yeah, and I put, purchased this for my grandchildren because my grandson's five and in prep and my granddaughter's uh, a bit over two and it, it's designed for two to eight-year-olds um, and I love the concept of this game. So can you just explain a little bit about how you play Bin Off? Yeah, so <laughs> Frog was the fun little game about frogs. Bin Off was the the part where I got serious because um, Bin Off is all about recycling education. I call it um, uh, trash trawling for the whole family. Um, <laughs> and the idea behind it is through quite simple gameplay, um, but with just enough strategy to kind of engage the older audiences, um, it does actually teach basic but good recycling strategies. Um, so it has is a, has a point scoring system where you when you sort bin sort waste sorry sort waste into the bins, um, you can get more or less points depending on which bin you sorted it into. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the whole point behind that is it's trying to show that these things could all go in the red bin or maybe the yellow bin, or you could donate it to somebody or you could reuse it for something. Um, and I have actually integrated mechanics in the game that inspire that sort of thinking. Um, like one of the mechanics is the is the contaminant mechanic. Uh, mm -hmm. So certain cards like the the old coffee beans, um, if you put it in another bin where it's not meant to be, it actually destroys that bin and you can't recycle anything in there, which is uh -huh. a very real thing. Um, yeah. So yeah. and it's a perfectly functioning gameplay mechanic as well. You can do that and destroy someone's chance of getting points, which is all funny when you're playing the game. But when everyone puts the cards down and actually has a thing, it's like, oh wait, that's a real thing, and we shouldn't. We should make sure we clean out this so we don't stop people from being able to recycle. Yeah, I, I love love the idea, and I haven't. I still have it because I haven't seen my grandson, but I'm looking forward to playing. And I also felt that it was a game that um, children could play by themselves and get mm. really good at because they'd be able to sort the cards into the rubbish and where they should go. But I loved your wrapping. I thought um, <laughs> this was very good. Sustain. Tell me about the wrapping. So obviously, shrink uh, plastic is a, a terrible thing, and it's very hard to recycle. Um, and I mean, Australia used to have a wonderful thing called Red Cycle, um, <laughs> which since went bust. Um, so now soft plastics are even less recyclable. So shrink wrapping my sustainable games all printed with recycled material seem like a very, you know, um, <laughs> what's the word? Uh, inappropriate yeah inappropriate let's just go with inappropriate it, and yeah. like i wasn't practicing what i preach if i shrink wrap mm. everything in horrible plastic that then has to fill up a landfill somewhere um so yeah i just use lucky bands which of course once you you can just put it back on there or you can take it off and use it for something else um i mean lucky bands themselves aren't you know wonderfully recyclable but they are reusable um that's right. and Could that's be part worse. of the whole thing yeah it's reduce reuse and recycle um yes. And if anything, it's better to try and reuse it than actually recycle it because then it's not even someone else doesn't have to deal with it. You're still using it in your home. 
Yes, actually, I'm glad you said rubber bands because or lucky bands because um, I'm holding holding up this display. And if you're watching a podcast, you wouldn't know what I'm holding up, but I am holding up <laughs> a, a rubber band here. Um, and so I thought that was really good too. But to to create a game like this would take you through a lot of steps in the process. So did you design the illustrations and things yourself? And what process did you have to go through? And I know that you know, manufacturing things is not cheap in Australia. So how oh, did you go about bringing them to life? Yeah, so I guess I was, I mean, I started on the video games because I liked video games, but um, programming stuff is hard. So I ended up doing the board game side. Um, but you still need to do art for board games. So uh, I'm trying not to get too much into life stories here, but back sure. in 2017, I taught myself how to do art. Um, I spent an entire year drawing something every day to build confidence and skills. Um, and since then, I looked at the fact that I studied game design. So I knew yeah, the basics. I still had a lot of practice to go, but I knew the basics of putting together a game. I taught myself art. So the next step was to actually just make something. Mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. you know, it's quite easy to make something. You know, put something, well, I shouldn't say that. It's not easy to make something, but um uh it's a relatively if you have the time and the effort and the skills you can put together a game yes um but then you have to try and produce it because you know if you want to try and do it do this sustainably for your wallet <laughs> um, <laughs> you need to fund it appropriately and find all those marketing things and make sure people buy it and all that sort of stuff um and i guess with the board games um <sighs> Yeah, you need to do a big investment to actually print a big print run because it costs a lot more to print smaller print runs than it does to print bigger print runs. Yes. Um, so with my Frodge game, I ran that through a Kickstarter um, mm -hmm. because, I mean, I'd been building my business for the, la for the, pr the about four or five years prior, uh, making a lot of connections, finding people who with like-minded interests or just playing lots of games with people being you know, in the games industry you just get to play games with people it's pretty cool you call that work yeah. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> um, i get to tell that to kids these days they're like so what do you do for work it's like oh i don't know i go home and play video games with people and then call it research <laughs> well i think you know because as i say i run a business network but i also mm -hmm. would say to my business network that there, com there are communities and networks in all sorts of things and really you know a game community or game people who are creating board games are all brought together because they've got a common interest and that's you know that's a community that's a network so you know when people talk about networking you have to do this and you have to do that networking is just not about business networking it's about connecting with people mm. that have got common interest and can all help you solve your problem so you know I'm sure you've met some really interesting people along the journey and uh, continue yeah. to meet them along the journey well for sure I mean that was the thing with the kickstarter about 90 percent of the support i got from the kickstarter were friends i'd made in the last five to 20 years mm -hmm. um you know it wasn't i didn't run any hype campaigns i didn't pay for i paid for one ad and all that one paid sponsored facebook ad got me was my first hate comment so because <laughs> <laughs> someone didn't want my cute little frog game on their timeline so whatever you know um, uh, that's that's uh, their their problem <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. So well, it was just those connections I made, exactly as you say, um, that helped support and fund my first game. Mm. I uh, I believe that anything's possible when you've got mm. the right support and the right people around you. Definitely. So, what have been the three biggest challenges that you <laughs> you've had? And I'm sure there's lots of them, but I also believe that problems are opportunities to you know find another way and to make another a uh, lot of decisions and another way to find the pathway through. So, yep. you know, what have, what have been the biggest challenges for you? So I guess with the, the Kickstarter being predominantly funded by friends, having had a successful Kickstarter, when I approached Binoff, I didn't want to run another Kickstarter because that felt like I was taking too much from the friends who had mm -hmm. wanted to support me initially. Um, and I guess that's that thing. You don't want to be demanding too much of the people who just... Yeah, they like to support you, but they don't want to be your lifeline or whatever the word is. Of course, of course. Yeah, yes. it's 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 a it's a give and take thing. Yes. Um, so funding is always an issue, and you know it's about discovering more about the products that you're making and new ways to get it out there. Mm -hmm. um, with Binoff, I decided to 
go for more of that educational standpoint because I was getting more into teaching and education around that time. Um, so to solve that, well, I guess we're still talk talking about challenges, but um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's absolutely fine because I, they are challenges, but, yeah. but, but you, you know, you have this uh, – great game and you know you were moved, came from Perth to Melbourne to be able to share it and so mm. you know there's other opportunity we would never have met if uh, we hadn't both stepped out of our comfort zone on that particular day to to yeah. go to an event um, that neither of us knew very much about so you know we have to be curious and get connected and be open to exploring really and and then you know I talk about that you explore but then you get excited about what what you might find and what you know you don't necessarily know where the end result will be so mm. uh it's about expanding your thinking and that sort of thing so how did you fund uh bin off in the end yeah so with bin off i actually speaking of going out of comfort zones with bin off i went to a what was it called it was a it was yeah it was actually a community forum event run by my local mp so christine tonkin um wonderful absolutely wonderful lady um she ran this event on recycling um and brought together a lot of people from various spaces of recycling um you know there was one of the heads of containers for change there there was people using recycled materials to do yeah, to do all sorts of stuff yeah, the, the list goes on um but i went there because i'd moved to the area recently because she's the member for churchlands and i live in now live in churchlands um, mm -hmm. So I went to that event with a box of my Frodge games, which I'd produced sustainably using recycled materials. Uh, and during the event, I actually had the idea for Bin Off um, because hearing all these wonderful conversations from people and having chats with them during lunch, um, I had this idea of, you know, the game of Uno doesn't teach you much, does it? But if you swapped out the colors and numbers for items of waste and bins where you can put them, then not only do you get to play a game that's a household name, um, it also teaches you something genuinely useful. Mm. Um, so that after that long string of story, I approached Christine Tonkin with the box of Rogers and this idea for this new game, told her where I'd come from, told her, you know, a very quick you know, backstory, much quicker than I just said. <laughs> um, and she said, that sounds amazing. Um, I am willing to fund this. Um, so what the next three or four months I had to develop the game um, yes. you know, give her a proof of concept, um, show her that I was actually, you know, I could put my money where, I'm, where my mouth was. Yes. Um, and I showed her that. And yeah, she funded half the entire printing cost, which was a lot because it was 500 copies. Yes. Um, and I mean, I don't know. I don't mind this being on recording. It cost me $10,000 to print that uh, much, which yeah. is not a small amount of money, especially when you're a creative. <laughs> no, exact. it's not exactly. And uh, talking to quite a few of the game board um, people at Melbourne Meeple Meeples, and I was you know, very impressed by the quality of uh, some of the print work and things that had been created by, uh, you know, everyone. Um, and, you know, selling your game and getting it out there is huge. So it is it is a big commitment and a, and a big um, passion thing. But when somebody like Christine uh, recognises the value, then that's a really big tick um, because yeah. you're, you've, hit, you've hit it on the, hit it on the mark. So how can people... Um, Get your game. Yeah. How's it so, available? <laughs> yeah. So um, I have two online stores. So I have a, a Ko-Fi or coffee store, uh, K-O-F-I. Um, I also have a Square store um, and Mind Games in Northcote sells, sells my game. Um, yes. The Herdsman Lake Discovery Center and a couple of places in Perth sell it as well. Um I guess the thing with it being recy printed recy with recycled material, it does look and feel very different from mm -hmm. a lot of the other games out there on the market. So it, there's been a bit of a challenge of getting people to, here we go, here's one of the challenges I forgot. Um, <laughs> it's been a bit of a challenge to get a lot of stores to pick it up because they 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 look at the game and think, oh, I'm, is, this doesn't really look up to standard to everything else here. Um, but that was part of what I, you know, that was my mission. I was trying to do something that wasn't, printed you know overseas shipped all the way over here you know yeah. i knew I exactly who was being paid it was done you know it was done the way we should be doing things in a way my game jane so if you were to play my game jane 
put that Jake. Um, and uh, you work your way around the board game a bit like a snakes and ladders in a sense, and you have points taken away from you and things like that. It's a card that says, who is your number one fan? Oh, my, num- my number one fan or who your I Your number one fan. Oh. Um, well, my mum's a big fan of my work. <laughs> I thought you would um, say that. You know, I had a feeling that that would be the response. And as a mother, both my but, parents definitely. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, mum does a lot of work with schools and teaching. Um, so I mean, she uses my games as well. <laughs> she yeah. she sings the praises, and you know, people like to say, "Oh, mums just do that." But you know, not everyone everyone yeah you know, gets involved so much. And ah, oh, you know, I don't. It's it's nice to have the support from your family. Um, you know, <laughs> absolutely. I I totally agree, and you know, I would hope that um, that my children would know that I'm one their number one fan, no matter what they sort of do. But it is very pleasing to be a parent whose children are trying to make a difference and trying to uh, help other people to expand their thinking and to grow. And you know, learning matters so much, and we're mm. role models and your parents have instilled uh, your love of uh, natural habitat um, and environment and it flows on. It's a ripple that you're passing on to other people and that's that's pretty awesome. So I really wish you a lot of success and I hope that uh, people will look into the game a bit more and be able to connect with you. Your I connected with you on LinkedIn. Is that the best place for people to s- seek you out or would you like to add um, your uh, website details in here and we'll put them in the show notes as well? Yeah, so probably the best way to – my LinkedIn is woefully uh, under under updated. I need to do more <laughs> on that one. Um, I probably spend the most time because I, I operate under the – business name of dapper cranium studios uh, um so dapper? that's probably the, dapper uh dapper as in like a, a dapper. very dapper top dapper hat. that's um, dapper that's right yes so um that's i have an instagram a facebook uh i do have a twitter but twitter's gone some weird directions these days so i don't really bother um and i guess that's not to go on another tangent but one of my biggest challenges I, is i do run all this by myself um so i try and update things where i can uh, but I do also have a WordPress website where everything's kind of consolidated onto one place. Uh, and that includes info about all the other work I do. Um, like I'm trying to write novels and I run board games workshops. Um, and hopefully this year I want to start a voiceover career as well. Yeah, <laughs> so amazing. It's amazing. out of shot, but I've got my very big, and it's not going to be in the thing, but I've got this very big microphone here, which is not <laughs> actually currently working because uh, I haven't set it all up. But I have the I have the equipment. Um, and I have some scripts that I need to just sit down and read and start that career. But uh, yeah. and where did where did that uh, come from? I mean, there's another creative tool that you've got there. So, uh, where did your interest in voiceovers and um... yeah? So I guess I um I I listen to a lot of pod uh, well podcasts uh audio books and things um and i love the accessibility of it um especially because i do a lot of work in other spaces uh i don't have a lot of time to sit down and read a book but i do quite enjoy that but if you can listen to it while doing your housework or doing all this sort of stuff um then it means you can you just it helps to enhance those sorts of activities as well like if you don't particularly like doing housework listen to a really nice audio book and then you're not actually doing housework, are you? You're experiencing something different. That's um, right. So That's I right. wanted to try and contribute to that space, you know, by being a narrator. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I think I think there's probably um, room in there for some sort of book about rubbish bins and what they eat, and that reminds oh, me perhaps yeah. of reminds me pro- probably of something like Sesame Street. Um, but uh, maybe <laughs> maybe we'll see your uh, books in print soon. And I uh, do thank you for your time today, and uh, look forward to watching your growth. And I'm really pleased that we've connected, and your contribution is excellent. And I hope uh, that we will have spiked some interest uh from our audience have you got a quote to leave us with today yeah so i wrote it on my phone so i wouldn't forget it and my phone's just turned itself off but here we go (laughs) these Um, things happen (laughs) oh it always does uh so go out into a cleared field and plant a tree by yourself and you have a lonely tree 
educate and inspire a generation on how to revegetate that cleared field and you have a forest for the future. And where did you find that quote? That's excellent. Um, I came up with that at 4 a.m. this morning when the rain came. <laughs> ah, so it's your very own quote. Uh, yeah, it. I made that. Well, I, I like to think a lot about, um, uh, you know, what, what, what an individual can do for a group. Um, yes. And obviously, as an individual making games, I do this, I make the sustainable choice. Um, but the games are there to try and spread the word uh, and get other people thinking, oh, this is something I could do as well. Um, and I feel like that's the biggest contribution I can do to the society and the world is be an educator. Um, and even if I don't always have the right answers, uh, which I definitely don't, um, <laughs> I'm not a, I'm not an encyclopedia. Um, I want to at least listen to people's problems and try to figure out a way forward or yeah. figure out something with them, you know, see and what we can do. Fantastic. And that's, that's, you know, one of the reasons that I created this podcast really, because mm. There are so many people out there with inspiring and amazing stories that need to be shared, and I'm only one person, but I can perhaps start a ripple um, to mm. spread the word and for that ripple to grow and make an impact and influence change. So thank you very much, Jake. Great Thanks, to talk Karen. to you, and let's keep in touch. Definitely. Definitely.